Okay, this is part 81 of Nosferatu. Shoot the moon fireworks, Illinois. In the dusty bright of early afternoon, Mr. Mannix swung the wraith off the road and into the dooryard of a fireworks warehouse. The place advertised itself with a sign that showed an engorged and furious moon with a rocket jammed in one eye bleeding fire. Wayne laughed just to see it, laughed and squeezed his moon ornament. The shop was a single long building with a wooden hitching post out front for horses. It came to Wayne then that they were black that they were back out west, where he had lived most of his life. Places up north had hitching posts out front sometimes, if they wanted to look rustic. But when you got out west, you sometimes saw piles of dirt, dry horse shit not far from posts like that. That was how you knew you were back in cowboy country. Although a lot of cowboys rode ATVs and listened to Eminem these days. Are there horses in Christmas land? Wayne asked. Reindeer, Mannix said. Tame, white reindeer. You can ride them? You can feed them right out of your hand. What do they eat? Whatever you offer them. Hay, sugar, apples. They are not fussy eaters. And they're all white? Yes. You do not see them very often because they are so hard to pick out against the snow. There's always snow in Christmas land. We could paint them, Wayne exclaimed, excited by the thought. Then they would be easier to see. He had been having a lot of exciting thoughts lately. Yes, Mannix said. That sounds like fun. Paint them red. Red reindeer. As red as fire trucks. That would be festive. Wayne smiled at the thought of it, of a tame reindeer patiently standing in place while he ran a paint roller over it, coloring him a bright candy apple red. He ran his tongue over his prickly new teeth, mulling the possibilities. He thought when he got to Christmas land, he would drill a hole in his old teeth, put a string through them, and wear them as a necklace. Mannix leaned to the glove department. Mannix leaned to the glove compartment and opened it and removed Wayne's phone. He had been using it off and on all morning. He was, Wayne knew, calling Bing Partridge and not getting an answer. Mr. Mannix never left a message. Wayne looked out the window. A man was coming out of the fireworks place with a bag in one arm. He held the hand of a blonde-haired little girl skipping along beside him. It would be funny to paint a little girl bright red to take her clothes off and hold her down and paint her wriggling, tight little body, to paint all of her, to paint her right, you would want to shave off all that hair of hers. Wayne wondered what a person could do with a bag full of blonde hair. There had to be something fun you could do with it. My lord, Bing, Mr. Minnick said, where have you been? Opening his door and climbing out of the car to stand in the lot. The girl and her father climbed into his pickup and the truck backed out across the gravel. Wayne waved. The little girl saw him and waved back. Wow, she had great hair. You could make a rope four feet long out of all that smooth golden hair. You could make a silky golden noose and hang her with it. That was a wild idea. Wayne wondered if anyone had ever been hanged with their own hair. Mannix was on the phone for a while in the parking lot. He paced and his boots raised chalk clouds in the white dust. The lock popped up on the door behind the driver's seat. Mannix opened it and leaned in. Wayne, do you remember yesterday I said if you were good, you could talk to your mother? I would hate for you to think Charlie Mannix doesn't know how to keep his word. Here she is. She would like to hear how you are doing. Wayne took the phone. Mom, he said. Mom, it's me. How are you? There was a hiss and crackle, and then he heard his mother's voice choked with emotion. Wayne? I'm here. Can you hear me? Wayne, she said again. Wayne, are you okay? Yeah, he said. We stopped for fireworks. Mr. Mannix is buying me some sparklers and maybe a bottle rocket. Are you all right? You sound like you're crying. I miss you. Mama needs you back, Wayne. I need you back and I'm coming to get you. Oh, okay, he said. I lost a tooth. A few teeth, actually. Mom, I love you. Everything is okay. I'm okay. We're having fun. Wayne, you're not okay. He's doing something to you. He's getting in your head. You have to stop him. You have to fight him. He's not a good man. Wayne felt a nervous flutter in his stomach. He moved his tongue over his new bristling hook-like teeth. He's buying me fireworks, Wayne said sullenly. He had been thinking about fireworks all morning, about punching holes in the night with rockets, setting the sky on fire. He wished it were possible to light clouds on fire. That would be a sight. Burning rafts of clouds falling from the sky, gushing black smoke as they went. He killed Hooper, Wayne, she said, and it was like being slapped in the face. Wayne flinched. Hooper died fighting for you. You have to fight. 
Hooper. It felt as if he had not thought of Hooper in years. He remembered him now, though, his great, sad, searching eyes staring out of his grizzled, yeti face. Wayne remembered bad breath, warm, silky fur, stupid cheer, and how he had died. He had chomped the gas mask man in the ankle and the Mr. Mannix. The Mr. Mannix. Mom, he said suddenly, I think I'm sick, Mom. I think I'm all poisoned inside. Oh, baby, she said. She was crying again. Oh, baby, you hold on. Hold on to yourself. I am coming. Wayne's eyes stung, and for a moment the world blurred and doubled. It surprised him to feel close to tears. He did not really feel sad after all. It was more like the memory of sadness. Tell her something she can u Tell her something she can use, he thought. Then he thought it again, but slowly this time and backward. Use something. Tell. I saw Grandma Lindy, he blurted out suddenly. In a dream, she talked all scrambled up, but she was trying to say something about fighting him. Only it's hard. It's like lifting, it's like trying to lift a boulder with a spoon. Whatever she said, just do it, his mother said. Try. Yeah, yeah, I, I will. Mom, Mom, something else, he said, his voice quickened with sudden urgency. He's taking us to see, but Mannix reached into the back of the car and snapped the phone out of Wayne's hand. His log scrawny face was flushed, and Wayne thought there was a vexed look in his eyes, as if he had lost a hand of cards he's expected to win. Well, that's enough chit-chat, Mr. Manick said in a cheery voice that did not match the glare in his eyes, and he slammed the door in Wayne's face. As soon as the door was closed, it was as if an electrical current had been cut. Wayne slumped back into the leather cushions, feeling tired, his neck stiff, and his temples throbbing. He was upset, he realized. His mother's voice, the sound of her crying, the memory of Hooper biting and dying, worried him and gave him a nervous tummy. I am poisoned, he thought. Poisoned am I. He touched his front pocket, feeling the lump made by all the teeth he had lost, and he thought of radiation poisoning. I am being eradicated, he thought next. Eradicated was a funny word, a word that brought to mind giant ants in black and white movies, the kinds of films he used to watch with his father. He wondered what would happen to ants in a microwave. He supposed they would just fry. It didn't seem likely they would grow, but you couldn't even know without trying. He stoked... He stroked his little moon ornament, imagining ants popping like corn. There had been a vague notion in the back of his mind, something about trying to think in reverse, but he couldn't hold on to it. It wasn't fun. By the time Mannix got back into the car, Wayne was smiling again. He wasn't sure how long it had been, but Mannix had finished his phone call and gone into shoot the moon fireworks. He had a slender brown paper bag, and poking out of the top of the bag was a long green tube in a single cellophane package. The labels on the side of the tube identified it as an avalanche of stars, the perfect ending to the perfect night. Mannix looked over the front seat at Wayne, his eyes protruding a little from his head, his lips stretched in a disappointed grimace. I have bought you sparklers and a rocket, Mannix said. Whether we will use either of them is another question. I am sure you were about to tell your mother you were on your way to see Miss Maggie Lee. That would have been spoiling my fun. I am not sure why I should go out of my way to provide you with a good time when you seem set on denying me my small pleasures. Wayne said, I have a terrible headache. Mannix shook his head furiously and slammed the door and tore out of the dusty lot, throwing a cloud of brown smoke. He was in a silk for two or three miles, but not far from the Iowa border, a fat hedgehog tried to waddle across the road and the race struck it with a loud thud. The sound was so noisy and unexpected that Wayne couldn't help himself and yelped with laughter. Mannix looked back and gave him a warm, begrudging smile, then put on the radio and the two of them sang along to A Little Town of Bethlehem and Everything Was Better.